guys. It's Rena Jadav here with JJ Virgin. JJ, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. All right. So we're talking about your virgin diet, seven pounds, seven days, seven foods. Amazing. So I love sevens. I, I, I can see that. It must be a lucky number for you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started with chapter one, um, food intolerances. Tell us a little bit about why is why are food intolerance is such a core part of your program? So here's what's interesting. When this all first started, I was doing food sensitivity testing in doctor's offices and people would come in with gas and bloating, joint pain, headaches, fatigue. They couldn't lose weight, skin problems. And we'd run this test that would, it's really a marker for leaky gut. How permeable is your gut? Because your gut should be semi-permeable, but it turns out that if you're under any kind of stress, you're eating gluten, you're eating fructose, you've been on any kind of pain medications, your small intestine can become more permeable. Mm -hmm. You couple that with poor digestion, rushed eating, lots of fluids while you're eating, maybe your stomach acids have declined because you're aging or under stress. And what happens is poorly digested particles of food get into circulation where they shouldn't be and your body launches an immune attack to them. And then these little particles build up as immune complexes and they create this reaction, which is what shows up in a food sensitivity test and which is what I'm calling food intolerance. What I started to see was that the same foods kept showing up hmm. and it was gluten and dairy and soy and corn were the first ones that showed up. Gluten was a different type of test, but it would still show up. And then the next year were um, peanuts, and corn and sugar was creating other problems. So I created this whole concept around food intolerance because I realized that testing actually was the least effective way to do it, that the single best test was to pull these foods out for a couple of weeks and then to re-challenge and see which foods worked for you and which foods didn't. Because if you're eating foods that don't work for you that are creating this immune response, it can create a whole host of symptoms. Again, the ones I described, Big one is inflammation, and inflammation can create weight problems, and also food intolerance can make you crave the very foods that are hurting you and cause you to overeat. And these are not allergies. That's why they don't show nope. up on a standard prick test. I know, because I was a uh -huh. prototypical patient of yours, right? So I had these 28 uh -huh. symptoms, and they said, oh, clearly you're allergic to something. You know, I have a face full of rashes. Dermatologist says, I'm sure we're going to figure it out. They put me through all these tests, nothing. No, when I first started doing this, these tests were considered like, you know, kind of quackery. I, I remember when I sat down and was doing the book, we just, we were trying to figure out what to call it because they kept trying to call it a food allergy. You know, it is not an allergy. Right. That is an IgE response. This is an yeah. IgG response. It's delayed. You'll eat the food and a couple hours later, or even the next day, you have a reaction. So you exactly. don't connect the dots between what you're eating and how you feel. You don't realize that it's the food that's creating all these problems. And in your opinion, it's the connection of the inflammation that these sensitivities are causing that leads to weight gain. That's part of it, but also the fact you start to crave these foods because mm. when you're eating these foods on a regular basis, and it's, you know, when you look at it, gluten, dairy, eggs, and soy, they're in everything. They're you everything. So if you're eating processed foods, you're getting those in because they sneak them into the silliest places that you'd never expect. So you're getting these foods, your body is, is got little antibodies waiting for them. And if you don't eat them, the antibodies are wondering where they are. And so you start to crave them too. So you've got both an inflammatory response that can then cause some insulin resistance and you have food cravings, also a big problem. So yes, all of that is leading to the weight gain. And for someone who's watching this going, nah, I don't have any intolerances. What test do you recommend? Now I did the fit test. Okay, well, first of all, I've heard that so many times. I eat these all the time. I'm fine. Yeah. The challenge is these low-grade responses, joint pain, headaches, fatigue, gas and bloating, difficulty losing weight, skin problems, you just accept them as normal for you, you know, and they're not normal. It's your body trying to tell you. So yes, you could go do a test, and there's only a few I like because it needs to be what's called an IgG4 test. So I like to have um, the standard IgG4 food sensitivity blood test. But honestly, there's a variety of different ways we can become intolerant to food. It could be 
through your immune system. It could be genetics, it could be hormonal. I think the very best test is to pull these foods out for three weeks or more, and then go back and one by one challenge them to see how you feel. Because Rena, I don't really care if a test says you're not intolerant. If you feel crappy when you eat it, what other, you know, what more do you need to know? Absolutely. And it's free. I used to have people run so the test true. and I pull them off the food and then they, I, I went, so this is free. It doesn't cost anything. And it only takes yeah. three weeks. Yeah. You know, By the time your results come back, you would have gone through the entire time period because it takes forever. To right. the test. And that's what actually happened. People would come and take the test in the interim between the test coming back. I would have them get off the foods. They'd come back in we would get the test results. I'm like, why did I bother with the test? Exactly. Like, I didn't need that. Exactly. You know, used exactly. a test for the outlier foods. So what I found was that 70% of people showed up with eggs and dairy. Mm -hmm. Then the next year was soy and peanuts and corn. And again, gluten was another type of test. Um, but where I use food sensitivity testing now is if we've done that, and people are still struggling, mm. then I wanna see if they have other reactions. And I would couple that with a really good stool test, like the DSL mm. uh, stool test, to see what else is going on, because it's probably something more with your gut microbiome and not necessarily with food intolerance. And remember, food intolerance is just really an indicator of the overall health and integrity of your small intestine. Exactly. And if you have some SIBO like I did, or leaky gut, mm -hmm. or dysbiosis, all this stuff gets exaggerated. Yeah. All right. Chapter two. So we're going to talk about how the virgin diet can work for you. Tell us a little bit about that before we get into the next set of chapters. So again, what I saw was that I was having people come in and they were doing their blood test and then I was putting them on the program. And I realized that actually by the time they came back to do the test, they'd gotten all the results. Mm -hmm. So if you are struggling with gas and bloating, joint pain, headaches, autoimmune disease, this really is the starting place for any kind of autoimmune disease, behavioral issues, moodiness. This is the starting point. Or if you're just wondering, how do I create a diet? How do I design my perfect diet? And I really think we need to have a name for diet versus daily eating plan because really you're using the virgin diet mm -hmm. to go through a process to design your daily eating plan yeah. and the important thing here is this should be done annually because what we're going to look at just like when you do a food sensitivity test you're looking at a moment in time and if you go through any kind of stress any big life changes you know, let's say you go through any type of hormonal changes, you go through menopause, stuff's going to change. Exactly. And you may now develop another food intolerance. Mm -hmm. So this to me is a starting point. Or if you want to jump off after that and check and see, maybe you have some issues with histamine or lectins or something else. You start here to really develop this first place part, normalize create your new diet because you connected the dots between what you're eating and how you feel, right? Now you know what you can be eating and then you can get stable and then you can go to the next level and look at maybe how many carbohydrates you should be eating or do I need to be working on histamine foods or whatever else could be going on with you. So true and I love the fact that a lot of what you talk about jives with the 5,000 year old science, which is Ayurveda. And a lot of that is about switching what you eat every season so you don't become sensitive to foods. And I think what, because we yeah. have access to everything, you know, we don't go to a farmer's market and eat what's in season. We kind of open a freezer and, or go into a grocery store, Whole Foods, and there's yeah. stuff from Peru to Norway. We're no longer limited by just what's available in season. We're eating everything all the time. You know, yeah, it's a problem. Food, if you look at the, what is. we should be doing seasonally, locally, you know, as close mm -hmm. to nature as possible. So we should be rotating those foods. Exactly, exactly. All right, chapter three, gluten gone. What's up with gluten? Why is everyone hating on gluten these days? <laughs> I love my bread and my cakes and it's been a real challenge. So you know, so it that. was so funny when I first started this because I think Wheat Belly came out maybe a couple months before my book. And then Grain Brain came out the year after and Pain in the Grain, you know, with Peter. Like yeah, so yeah. when I first came out, you would think that I said, 
you know what? There's no tooth fairy. There's no Easter bunny. <laughs> there are people like, what? Born and, uh, on the steak. <laughs> so the issue with gluten, there's a couple issues. The first issue is that gluten is very different in the United States than it is in some of the other countries because of the way we've genetically engineered it. We've dwarfed it and concentrated it. So we've made it extra gluteny. Mm -hmm. And gluten, the big thing that it does in the body is that it can loosen the tight junctions in the small intestine because it triggers the release of something called zonulin. And so that leaky gut we were talking about, gluten makes for leaky gut. So that's the first thing. It also can trigger autoimmune disease. So that's super scary. I know that you've talked with Tom O'Brien. I mean, he's the king of like, you know, do not touch gluten with an autoimmune disease. It can also create leptin resistance, which makes you hungrier. So those three and more insulin resistant. So those are the three problems specifically with gluten. And, you know, when we think of gluten, we think, oh, bread and pasta. But the challenge is they put wheat flour on steak to make it taste better. They put yeah. wheat flour on French fries. So it's in all sorts of things it's you wouldn't jam. think about. It's in everything. It's in shampoo. Yeah, it's mustard. I mean, it's like, it's so crazy. It's in so many things. So there's that issue. But the other problem is what we're doing to the wheat and the glyphosates. So, you know, you kind of look at it and it's sort of the debate in the health community is, is it the gluten or is it the glyphosates? And it's like, well, it's, it's all of the above, you know? So we've got what gluten does to the body in terms of leptin resistance and the leaky gut and autoimmune triggers. But we also have the issues with it being sprayed by Roundup and the glyphosate on there and that triggering a whole host of health problems too. You know what I've heard is icorn wheat, which is still yeah. sort of called the heirloom wheat. Um, cooked in a way where it's been fermented is actually yeah. the authentic way. It's a totally different food. So, right. like if it's you pre digested, it, it's yeah. organic. It's yeah, the like seed. einkorn wheat eaten as sourdough bread, where it has been fermented, it's easily digestible, is a completely different food right. than our hybridized wheat turned right. into flour and like put on a French fry. You know? Absolutely. And those are organic too. So they haven't been genetically engineered. They haven't been sprayed with chemicals. And they've also been um, fermented so that you drop the lectin and phytate load. So all of that. But that's that's not what people are eating. No. No. no and in fact, I've had arguments with people who've said, well, I mean, but I'm eating sourdough. You said to eat sourdough. Well, the challenge is that the breads that say sourdough are actually not using sourdough starters. They're again using fake them. chemicals, right? Just to create that sourdough texture. It's a chemical, it's, it's made in a lab. It Yuck. is not an authentic sourdough. So, you know, fair warning, just because it says sourdough doesn't actually mean that it's your authentic sourdough. Now in this chapter, are you also referring to removing gluten from other products or is this primarily from your diet? Well, your skin is a sieve. So you really don't want to be putting it on your, you know, because it's in hair products and lotions mm -hmm. and a lot of other stuff. So ideally, you know, if you're putting it on your face, it's going into your body. And faster, apparently, is what I've heard. You know, it's like you really want to look. I mean, the bottom line is you've got to look at everything that you're doing, um, all the household cleaning products. And that's not where you see it. Where you tend to see this, a lot of the hair care products have it and a lot of the personal so personal care is a big issue and yeah. then you do look at it there's some staff yesterday on a documentary i was watching that said that women put on a thousand chemicals before they leave the house every morning this is horrified ah. horrified wow all right chapter four no joy in soy mm -hmm. so now you're going to take soy away I, it was it's so food. funny so kind of the classic part of the virgin diet is that you take one food and you swap it for something else. And when I first did this, there were not a lot of alternatives. I mean, there was a lot of gluten-free junk food is what I'll call it. I said, if you weren't eating cake before, don't start eating cake now because it's gluten-free. <laughs> but, you know, there weren't a lot of different options beyond soy, soy milk. Like now there's coconut milk and almond milk and hemp seed milk and flaxseed milk. I mean, it's like, it's so Damia milk is a new one. I love it. Which one? 
macadamia nuts. Oh yes, I've got some in my fridge right now. So um, here's the challenge with soy. Uh, if you look at, there was a study done on Japanese men in Hawaii that found that those who ate tofu three times a week, they were talking about moderate soy consumption, had smaller, like their brains were basically shrinking. We know that soy can lead to dementia, it lowers thyroid um, function. It has trypsin inhibitors that can impact your pancreas. So, but the biggest thing is really that impact on your thyroid. Then the other issue is the way we're consuming soy. Number one, soy is right there with corn in terms of one of the most genetically modified crops. And why do they modify the crops? So they can spray the heck out of it right? And feed so, it to the poor cows. Uh, and, then, and then to feed it to the cows and the chickens. It's a disaster. So you've got, and fish, they're feeding yeah, fish. They're feeding fish the salmon, that's right, farmed salmon. It is, it is ridiculous. Like, talk about really messing up Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. So it's genetically modified. It impacts your hormones, especially thyroid. And if your thyroid's not working well, nothing is going to be working well. Mm -hmm. And if you were going to eat it, back how it was eaten thousands of years ago. It was used, by the way, thousands of years ago to put nitrogen back in the soil. It wasn't thousands of years ago developed so that it would be a food crop. But then when they started using it as food, they realized that in order to get rid of the phytates and lectins that would block mineral absorption, they had to heavily ferment it before eating it. So in traditional cultures, and I know because I lived in Japan, you ate it heavily fermented and it was organic. Exactly. So it wasn't soy ice cream. It wasn't, right? Oh, I mean, absolutely. it wasn't soy chips, soy hot dogs. Exactly. And I think as we went into- Fake foods. Fake foods. All that fake food. I went to, we have this thing in our, in our industry, maybe you've gone to it called Expo West, and it's the biggest um, supposedly natural foods conference in the world, but it's the biggest manufactured crappy junk food, t you know, trying to pose as health foods. So, you know, I'm sorry, soy ice cream, like you're supposed to eat as close to nature as possible. Exactly. And soy ice cream is not a health food. It's just I'm not. So. No, it is not. All right. So all soy is out. And again, I'm assuming uh, not well, even remember, this soy. Is out, this is out for the first three to four weeks. Right. As you let your immune system come down, calm down, you're mm -hmm. giving your body a chance to reset. You're starting to establish a new normal. So you see what foods, you know, what feeling good really feels like. And then we'll see at the end of that time, you know, is this something that you could eat, a, a, you know, very organic fermented every once in a while or not, Got you it. know? Mm -hmm. And for everyone out there who's watching this and going, geez, that's such a long time. I did it for 18 months, people. No soy, oh, no three corn. Weeks. It's not even a credit card bill. It's, it's nothing, Stop right? It. 18 months. Yeah. This is nothing. Like you'll blink and it'll be over. Well, plus there's great alternatives for every single thing. So, I mean, what, uh, first of all, no one's going to tell me they really love tofu. I don't believe you. <laughs> I, 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 I do have a really good tofu recipe, but yes. Yeah, <laughs> gross. You gotta you know, do so <laughs> we have so many great, um, great options out there that I find that people don't miss the foods at all. In fact, they like the new food, foods usually yeah. better. I think so is the easiest one to skip. Yeah. All right. The next chapter is a harder one to skip though. So chapter five, dump the dairy. Oh boy. This is where everyone gets super upset. Because isn't, isn't yogurt meant to be so good for me? Mm -hmm. And doesn't it have the probiotics that I might have? Yogurt. You know, it's so interesting. Activia. Uh, this is the biggest, this is the biggest challenge for people by far. Um, and I'll have people say, listen, I can get rid of the gluten and the soy and the corn and the peanuts and the eggs, but the dairy, I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to do drop six foods. And what I like in dropping six foods too is if you were sitting on seven tacks right now, right? How would your butt feel? Oh yeah. Not good. Awful. Awful. So, so you'd get up and you go, you know what? I'm going to take six tacks away and then I'm going to sit back down on that last tack. Yeah. That's what Still painful. You can't, you cannot not pull the cheese out. The cheese, I, I will tell you the dairy was the hardest thing for me. Oh my gosh. I mean, I grew up right outside of San Francisco. I grew up on cheese and sourdough bread. Like those were my things. And then yogurt from Yogurt Park in Berkeley. Um, Yum. Yeah, all my favorite stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. And then I was like, I mean, 
you know, yogurt, frozen yogurt was my meal. That was it. It was so healthy. But um, dairy has a lot of issues. The biggest, the biggest issue is it, it raises insulin. So it's, and especially a lot of these non-fat, if you're pulling the fat out, something's got to stay in. And usually what's happened is now you've just got a bunch of what I call liquid sugar. Mm -hmm. So the biggest challenge that happens with dairy is that it's very insulinogenic. It raises insulin. So in terms of trying to lose weight and lose inflammation, dairy is very inflammatory and very insulin producing. This is super duper problematic. And if you have any skin problems at all, mm -hmm. like I struggled with my skin from the age of 12 until the day I dropped dairy. Wow. And I hear that over and over again. And it's funny because people will argue to keep dairy in and they'll keep oh, yeah. swearing how dairy is. they're addicted. But they're they, addicted they are. Dairy is so more. addictive. There was a wonderful documentary that in fact even showed, and of course then there's the whole calcium argument, right? Well, why- Oh, that's ridiculous, dairy. yeah. And there was this documentary which showed in fact that countries that had the highest consumption of dairy had the highest rate of osteoporosis. Yes, yeah, and so that's what's so funny. And the kids that drink the most milk have the, they did the nurses study here, the nurses that drank the most milk had the highest rate of osteoporosis. And people go, but the, but the calcium, yeah. first of all, the calcium is not the important factor in your bone health. It's exactly. being alkaline so you don't leach the calcium exactly. out of your bones. It's having good vitamin D so you absorb calcium. It's having good vitamin K so you put it in the right places. You know, there's so many things that are involved in bone health and everyone's like tries to say it's the calcium. But the calcium in, in milk is very poorly absorbed because milk's acidic. So that's the other big joke here is that drinking exactly. milk, exactly. you know, the whole silly milk mustache and drink. Exactly. <laughs> That's again what the industry did. What a brilliant campaign. I mean, dairy was incredible. Not consumed right up until those those ads with those yep. you know, mustaches, but also those brownies. I'll never forget, like driving, going, Oh, I think I'm gonna pull over and buy some cake for myself and some milk. Those ads were so compelling. And so, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, anytime anyone goes on any kind of a diet, I'm assuming, you know, I always say, stop watching ads, stop watching TV, yeah. because they are going to corrode on your willpower. And make well, remember too, so your body, you eat a food, the antigens from the food pass through your small intestine because it's leakier. Your body has antibodies that grab a hold of the antigens and form immune complexes. You decide to stop eating the food. The immune complexes start to go away, but the antibodies are still lying in wait, waiting for that dairy, and they're going to be very noisy and angry, wanting to get it for three or four days. So what's important here is if there's a food that you're going, I can't give that up, that is your kryptonite. That is mm -hmm. the classic sign that you have a food intolerance to that food. That's the food. That's the one to go. Yep. All right, chapter six, you want us to pluck the eggs, corn, and peanuts. This what? was very tough for me because um, eggs, I've always felt like, are like the perfect food. They're young. And, I love eggs. You know, they're just, I mean, they, they're so easy to do. If you're trying to eat a lower carb diet, this is such a quick source of protein. And then I started to look at all these food sensitivity tests and uh, gosh, they were the, one of the highest, it was eggs and dairy, the highest reactions. I'm like, damn. Now there's two things here with the eggs. You are what you eat. Eight. So I always wonder with the eggs, is it the egg or is it because the chicken is being fed GMO corn and soy? Mm. So it's very important as you go through this program, you're going to pull the eggs out for three weeks and they can be a trigger for autoimmune disease. But when you do bring them back, bring back pastured eggs. So for me, I will eat pastured eggs like once or twice a week, no problem. But if I go back to eating crappy eggs, which, mm. you know, factory eggs are like eating factory chicken or farmed salmon or, you know, that factory meat, it's crap, right? Absolutely. No, so, absolutely. So that's the egg deal. And again, no eggs. And again, warning for everybody out there, eggs are in everything. So, they're in everything. Well, we're, see, if you don't eat processed food, then you no longer have an issue yes. with any of this. Yes. Um, and they even have avocado oil mayonnaise now. So my I love choice foods. I yeah. Love so in Primal Kitchen. Um, Primal Kitchen, yeah. 
Yeah, that's what I've known Mark for 30 years. So I have to always do a shout out to Mark Sisson. Um, so as far as corn goes, corn is just a junk food. First of all, it's genetically modified. It's sprayed with a bunch of stuff, but it's high starch with not, you know, some of the higher starch foods like potatoes have more resistant starch. So awesome, but not corn. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, you know, a higher starch, turn into sugar, easily food that is genetically modified. There's just nothing positive to be said here about it. And I really feel that corn is so addictive. I mean, between cornflakes popcorn and popcorn. Exactly. Yeah. So you go into movie theater. We stopped going into movie theater. We watch movies in our own theater now because I can't resist the smell. And no, of course, that popcorn is toxic. And it's what endless these, buckets. It's endless yeah. buckets. <laughs> Who are they feeding? Like, so oh my gosh. Of that crappy, I mean, yeah. that is the grossest Spray. stuff ever. It's Horrible. Just poison. It's just poison. And you've got someone eating on your left. You've got someone eating on your right. So and I they're having a diet coke with it. Which <laughs> is <laughs> diet so, coke. <laughs> but remember the the air poppers, and I, I just remember eating, you know, so much of that crap. Oh, and yeah. all it does is hijack your blood sugar, raises yeah. your blood sugar, raises your insulin. Yeah. And they're what my buddy, Do Dr. Alan Christensen calls dry carbs. And I love this description of dry carbs. They're your trigger foods. So I don't know one person anywhere who could have one cup of popcorn. So true. Like ever. So that yeah. always drove me crazy too. I'm like, if it's a trigger food, I don't care too much healthy foods, unhealthy. We need to eat less, less often anyway. Yeah, um, so that's that's and peanuts. Corn. And then peanuts are not a nut. They're a bean. They're a bean. They're a legume. I learned that when I was doing the Virgin Diet audiobook. I learned that it's not a legume. It's a legume. It's a legume. Um, it's a legume. My nose mold in it. It's like one of the highest mold yes. products. Yeah, it's one of the highest aflatoxin foods. And the problem is they don't test for it. So. It's of course they are tiny, giving them peanut butter sandwiches. Like why have that when I just feel fortunate growing up, I never liked the peanut butter sandwich, but mm -hmm. like almond butter, macadamia nut butter, pecan butter, you can get these everywhere now. So, and almond butters are awesome. They actually have a compound in them that helps your body absorb less of the fat. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. You know, I, um, so I've got a 13 year old, my 19 year old is in college. It's too late to do anything for her at this point, but my well, my newly turned 14 year old still at home, so I get to experiment on her. <laughs> and she still actually listens to me because, you know, I pack her lunches. Um, so I started experimenting, and, you know, she's been uh, Nutella. You never give me Nutella. I'm the most deprived. You can make person. Nutella from I use my chocolate protein powder yes. with almond butter. Oh, so I do hazelnuts. I buy just hazelnuts, I raw organic hazelnuts, roast them, grind them up with your chocolate protein powder, and just toss a little bit of um, maca root, because it's so good for you anyway, and you know, all that good stuff. And I'll put a little bit of organic honey, and I kid you not, it is so close. Oh, oh and cacao, cacao nibs. It's just and, like a new And you've got protein, I mean like, yeah. and now it's healthy for you. That's what's yeah. so cool, like it so is. cool. It is, and it's awesome. such a yummy treat, and so I've saved my position of being the mother, you know, she's, she's back to- Okay, hey, just wait on your kids. Like, my kids growing up, you know, they're always a little irritated by all of this, and then my one kid goes off to college. He goes, you know, if you wanted to give me some vitamins, I'd take them. I'm like, that's interesting. And then he starts, I start looking at his Instacart orders. The kid is like, he's now doing a lot of our recipe creation for the for the company. Wow. Yep. That's so awesome. it all wears off on them, even if they get like, act like they're not paying attention. Oh, hashtag proud mom, JJ Virgin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. Chapter seven, the sweetness trap. Yeah, that's for me. All I'm right. Overholic, been all my life. Tell me about the sweetness trap. You know, it's interesting. I actually wrote another book, The Sugar Impact Diet, just because this chapter stirred up so much stuff. Who knew? Um, and what's interesting is I don't have a sweet tooth genetically, um, but my I was raised by an adopted mom who's got a crazy sweet tooth. So I was raised on Pop-Tarts and all this stuff that I weaned myself off of entirely by the age of 12. And when I told people to pull the sugar out, I didn't think it'd be any big deal. Well, I was wrong. And um, it seems that 
people are either confused. They're like, but it was, it was honey. It's okay. And I'm like, no, it's not okay. Or two bananas. What's wrong yeah. with two bananas? No, or it was just juice. It was juice. It was great. It was fine. Um, or, you know, or it's, or it doesn't have any calories. It's some artificial sweetener or they yeah. could not quit it because sugar is, uh, and I love this phrase from Dr. Mark Hyman, our number one recreational drug of choice. It truly yeah. is. It is. And the challenge with it in terms of food intolerance, when I first was doing the Virgin Diet, I was doing it as an online program and it was dropping six foods. I didn't address sugar oh. because it doesn't do an IgG food response, right? Uh, but the problem was when you don't tell people to pull it out, you tell them to pull those other things out, you know what they did? They went crazy on this. I was like, what is this? So, and also fructose can make your gut more permeable yeah. besides being one of the most, you know, it is the most aging sugar. It's also mm -hmm. creates insulin resistance, but it also makes your gut more permeable. And then artificial sweeteners change the gut microbiome to be more glucose intolerant. So there's no way to look at food intolerance without pulling sweeteners out. Now, this does not mean that you can't have the natural sugar that would be say, you know, in strawberries or a sweet potato, but we are not gonna be adding sugar or artificial sweeteners to anything that we're eating. And also becoming aware of places like fruit juice or fruit juice concentrate. I say fruit juice is like a soda. In fact, apple yeah. juice is more high fructose corn syrup than a, or more fructose than a, a soda. Yeah. And dried fruits like candy, Mm -hmm. And the fruit concentrates that you'll they'll use for sweeteners are just syrups. The jams, same thing. They're just syrups. So we're not going to add anything like that. And we're going to make sure we're choosing, you know, natural, minimally processed foods that don't add sugar to them. The kind of max is of, of five grams of a sweetener added in. But usually you can get it with way less than that. And the acceptable sweeteners are stevia, monk fruit, xylitol and erythritol because those ones don't create any of the problems and allulose actually is the kind of the, the new sweetener that's really interesting too mm -hmm. um but that's why we've had to pull them out and if someone's got a lot of issues with that if they're listening to this and they're freaking out the place you want to go first is the sugar impact diet where i teach you how to taper down not go cold turkey because if you have a real issue with sweet with the sweet tooth um, or sweet tastes due to stress or maybe candida or training, exposure equals preference or genetics, then you do need to learn how to taper down and retrain your taste buds to appreciate the natural sweetness of foods and to like savory and to learn how to eat, you know, the trifecta of fat, fiber, and protein before you start to really pull it out or you'll freak out. Yeah, I'll give my example. So I had 28 symptoms, almost died. And one of the things that I was able to connect the dots with was in fact, sugar of any kind. So JJ, in my case, it turned out if I had more than five grapes, I would get gas and bloating. Um, so you're fructose intolerant. Completely fructose intolerant yeah. and carb malabsorption. So sweet potatoes were also a no-no. Mm -hmm. And so for anyone who's listening to this and you've got the gas blowing, take the sugars out like completely, even the sweet it's, it, it's amazing how much, and here's the challenge. Like I don't really eat sugar. I don't feel good if I eat, like I don't even really eat fruit. I'll eat it every once in a while. It, you do, you're like, ugh. Um, but the more of it you eat, the more your body begins to tolerate yes. that sugar. Yes. You, you don't, and you actually get better at um, getting fructose transformed to fat in the liver. Mm -hmm. You don't Daddy want to be good at that. Mm -hmm. Like no one wants to be good at, at, at making fat. Never. No, no, <laughs> never. Yeah. And there's again, a lot of science around, you know, years ago, we didn't eat fruit all the time. We ate fruit right. when it was in season for a very short period of time. And it was never this sweet. All these massive apples look nothing like the apples of the, of the days. These grapes, I picked up organic grapes two days ago and my husband was like, these grapes are bigger than my eyes. Like, where'd you find them? They're these big suckers. Yeah. So sweet. Like two grapes and you're on the floor with insulin. Well, uh, here's what's interesting too about that. If you really think about it. So we used to, it, it used to be that you could only get fruit during the summer mm -hmm. in the good old days. Right. Yeah. Um, and during the summer, we have longer days. If we have longer days, we're sleeping less. Yes. If we're sleeping less, we're more insulin resistant. If we're more insulin resistant, we're storing more food as fat. 
If we're storing more food as fat, we're preparing for the winter when there's yes. short days, less food, and we become more insulin sensitive because we're sleeping more. Exactly. So basically the way mother nature intended this to be was we'd have all of the sugar because mm -hmm. that's what fruit provides. Mm -hmm. It has fiber and it's phytonutrients, but it provides, you know, it's the highest source of sugar naturally. Mm -hmm. So we'd have all this sugar with long days to get fat over the summer exactly. so that we could survive the winter. Exactly. So all of this using fruit as your dessert and who needs dessert anyway, it's ridiculous, but using fruit like it's a free food is just insane. I think Weight Watchers started that problem, pretty sure. Oh, I'm sure they did. Well, I, again, I'll give you a statistic of one. I'm a sugarholic, I'm a declared sugarholic, 18 months, no sugar. I got back my health, I started little, little again, and I'm back to fighting the cravings again. And just last week, I was declaring to my family very loudly over dinner table, that's it, I'm done, I'm giving up my sugar again. <laughs> because there's no, for people like me, I think we haven't found this out yet, but I think it's a microbiome issue. I think there's bacteria I was born with that lost sugar. And for 18 months, I killed them, new bacteria came in, they didn't want sugar. But the moment I started eating sugar again, they started to grow again. So well, also genetically, mm -hmm. there are people who have a sweet tooth and they're sweet tasters. And if you have um, that, the more sugar you eat, the minute you start doing it, you want more and more and more yes. and more. Yes. And once you know that about yourself, you know what your kryptonite is? Yeah. Like it's gotta go. It's gotta go. Like mine would never be that. But again, like you talked about a bucket of popcorn with salt. Oh no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's it. I'm lit up. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So figure out what your kryptonite is and uh, no sugar. Take, take Well, an, an important thing there that you said, you know, you could say, oh, but that's healthy. Well, too much food, it doesn't matter what it is, yeah. is unhealthy. So don't go kid yourself going, it was just grapes. Yeah, you know? well, we're so good at justifying. Oh, it was just a pound of blueberries. Blueberries are so good for you. Yeah, but not a pound of them. Yeah. Yeah, I've been there, done that. All right, so let's get to the next section. Now let's talk about elimination, uh, which is chapter eight. So how do we get started with the elimination process? All right, so this is where we get into this whole thing. And what I have you do first is you are going to take a food intolerance quiz. So you really see where you are, because again, you know, you can do real testing, but the best test is your own body and how it feels. So we're gonna look at where your starting point is, both in terms of your weight and your waist and hip measurements, because I wanna make sure that as you're losing weight, you're losing your waist. If you lose weight and you don't lose your waist, you just made yourself worse, not better, right? Mm -hmm. And then we also wanna make sure that these symptoms that you're aware of, gas and bloating, joint pain, headaches, fatigue, skin problems, food cravings, weight gain, that you're monitoring these as well. Because what I find with people, maybe this just came from like being irritated and frustrated because you have a client and they do this for a month and go, I didn't notice a thing. And you're like going, well, you dropped 10 pounds, your skin cleared up, you're not bloated, you don't look pregnant, and you notice nothing. So it's really important to track all this stuff because as you get into your new normal, you forget yes. how crappy you felt. Yes. So that's the first part is to know your starting point. And then for three weeks at least, and you can go longer, you are going to pull out those seven foods. But what I did was I created swaps in the book for all of them. Because again, what I, what I really like to do is I like to add before I take away, right? But at least I want to give you a really good alternative because I found that if I don't, people come up with some really bad things, you know? Um, and there's so many simple things out there. My gosh, there's almond cheese. I made an almond yes. cheesecake for Thanksgiving that was oh. in insane insane wow. yeah almond so i made a pumpkin almond cheesecake do you use kite um, hill as your base cheese? i do i love i love kite hill, kite hill is amazing oh my gosh yeah. so there's amazing cheeses out there there's amazing like oh gosh where you used to have the flour tortilla there's coconut cassava tortilla That's so right. we have all of those different things out there for you so again what I find with people is as they're going through and they're learning what to swap their gluten for, what to swap their soy for, I have instead of starting the day with eggs, you start the day with one of my um, protein shakes. You just learn how to do these things mm -hmm. that it's just changing habits. Mm -hmm. And you start to feel better so fast. I mean, within four days, the average person 
in the first seven days loses up to seven pounds, which is crazy. Um, and I had someone very disappointed. They lost like 10 pounds in a week and then they only lost two pounds the next week. I'm like, um, you know what? <laughs> and they hadn't lost weight forever. You know, I'm going, all right, you know, you just can't please everybody. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to normalize after that you're reducing inflammation. Right. But that's the first part is really getting clear on those swaps. You right. keep a food journal during this time. And it's really important to have a food journal because yeah. if you do feel crappy, uh, let's say that you ate lunch in the afternoon, you go, God, I just don't feel good. Well, it may be that something snuck into that meal that you ate. And you just weren't aware of it. Right. So then you can look back and go, what was going on there? Now, since I wrote the book, I actually created a product that breaks down gluten and dairy and eggs and soy. Wow. Because I found when people were eating out, it was, you know, it's gotten a lot easier now, but it makes it easier so that they're kind of protected. It's called safety net. But it's just, it's, we give you everything that you need to eat over the course of time. You know exactly what to do. And you do that for three weeks. And again, you're checking, I have you now checking your weight every single day because you're shifting so often and it's good to see. And then each week looking at those symptoms to see how you're changing. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So I'll put a plug in here for the health journal. I think the most important thing you can do when you start any of these journeys is to start writing. So what's yeah. your baseline? And so for me personally, I had 28 symptoms and I didn't know where I was coming or going and I couldn't figure it out. And so I, you know, you always resort to what you know best. So in my case, technology, entrepreneurship, I was like, why don't I create something that's going to help me track myself? I call it the health journal and we offer it for free on our site. You can just go online, download it and print it out and use it. And it allows you to track your moods, your foods, your meds, your gratitude, any awesome. reminders. Yeah, and we we find that that's just amazing for those who do boot camps in general because that is so good. Here's yeah. why that's so important. Kaiser did a study, and they looked at a group of people who were trying to lose weight, and the differentiator between those who were successful and those who weren't the one difference was the amount they journaled. Amazing. The people who were huh? Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the people who were journaling consistently lost twice as much weight. Now, wow. here's what's super cool about that. It's free. Exactly. It's free. Like exactly. everything we've described so far is free. You know, when I have people swap their foods, I'm not saying, hey, buy all this other stuff. No, we're just swapping. Exactly. Where, where you would have bought one thing, you buy something else. Exactly. So there's no like... You can't say, oh, I couldn't do that. I couldn't afford it. Nope. You can't exactly. say that. <laughs> exactly. So if you're watching this and you're looking for excuses not to do it, yeah. there are that's no, not one. <laughs> there are no excuses. <laughs> no, there's one excuse. I just want to sit and feel crappy. Well, then, that's okay. True. That's yeah. true. Yes. Um, but and you're you entitled to, be, to that. Yeah. If you want to be your person, see, I believe in, and you are the, just like the role model for this, that we need to be our own personal health detectives that while you go to the experts and consult with them, you have, you've got your journey. That's why journaling is so key and critical. And you know, why, what you're doing here is so key and critical because you go out and you start to learn and then you go through these different things and you pay attention to what happens with each one of those things and you continue to get better and better and better. It's a journey. It always will be. You're just peeling an onion, right? Exactly. And it's for life. It's really something that you do, for, you undertake for life as something that you're going to do. It's not something that's short term. You start short term, but then you'll notice, as JD shared earlier, you love how you feel and then you're never going to want to go back again. So, um, all right, well, let's move on to the next chapter, which is reintroduction. So someone who's going through the program and has now gone through, taken things out. Now, what's the process of bringing those foods back in? So here's what is so funny about all this. I think that people, when they buy the book, go through elimination and then they um, shut the book and just go off and do their thing. Because they feel so much better. Because I've had people come up to me and they go, oh, I'm off those seven foods. And I go, how long has it been? They go, years. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, did you challenge back to see if you could eat any of them? No, I didn't want to. I feel so good. Yeah. And I go, I, I love that. And I really don't believe that people should be eating gluten or dairy or soy um, or corn or peanut. I, think I really think gluten 
not a good food. Dairy, a lot of problems. Okay, occasionally maybe some good goat cheese, mm. raw, you know, okay. Um, same thing with soy. But for the most part, you're better off really leaving those foods out. I think pastured eggs are pretty, are an amazing food. However, the book was not written saying drop seven foods forever. The book was written so that you would pull these seven foods out, go through this process, let your immune system calm down. Mm -hmm. Then at the end of that time period, which has to be at least three weeks, but can be longer, you go back, you reassess. And then what you do one by one is you pick a food and you take that food and you eat that food every day for four days or until you start to notice symptoms which could be immediate or could be none at all. Yeah. And you need to track those symptoms every day to pay attention to see if it's bothering you. So you do that for gluten, you do that for dairy, you do that for soy, you do that for eggs. Now, I don't do that for sugar because sugar needs to stay out. It's artificial sweeteners should yes. never be eaten again. They're, they're the worst bad yes. chemical, like they are a bad science experiment on the US population that yeah. is so detrimental it's i still can't believe they're even allowed so you go back and you, i want you to test the gluten dairy soy and eggs for sure my feeling is you know sugar is going to stay out and artificial sweeteners completely um and the next step i have people do after they do the virgin diet is go do the sugar impact diet that's how they were written but um peanuts you know you swapped them from almond butter they really shouldn't have a part in your diet it doesn't make any sense with the aflatoxin issue. And the same with corn, like why eat corn? So you can go and challenge them if you want to, but to me, you're better off 90% of the time, 95% just keeping them out. With the other four that tend to be very reactive, what I wanna find out here is how reactive are you? Are you like, I need to go to the hospital reactive? Cause I remember the first time I ate um, eggs after this all happened, I was, I was going to go speak at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, A4M, their big conference, 10,000 doctors. I had to speak on this subject and some mayonnaise, I, I, I don't even know what I was thinking. I ordered this sushi with the little spicy sauce and mayonnaise, uh, like maybe this much mayonnaise. And I was, it looked like, I looked like Sigourney Weaver with oh, alien no. coming out of my oh, no. it was so bad so what i want you to do is i want you to test one food at a time in a very controlled environment and i walk you through that in the book because you need to see how reactive you are i can eat eggs now but it took me six months of healing my gut to mm -hmm. get to that point if i eat dairy i've connected the dots i break out two days later it's like classic and i get gas and bloating within a couple of hours joint pain from gluten so that doesn't work yeah Soy doesn't create any reaction, but I don't think it's a food you want to be eating. And I've got, you know, I've got thyroid disease, so I'm not going to be getting into to soy. So I've connected the dots. That's what I want you to do is you go through and you go, all right, you're connecting the dots. And here's why that's so cool and important. It changes the conversation. I work in the world of weight loss. I've been working in weight loss for 35 years. Wow. I have heard women beat the heck out of themselves. They'll go, I had a bad day. I'm such a bad person. I want to change the conversation around food. This is not being a bad person or a good person. We are hardwired to seek out sugar and fat and to gorge so that we survive. Yes. You know, so yes. you saying, oh my gosh, there was a big cake in front of me and I like ate it. Of, you know, of course you did. That's like yes. your old lizard brain saying, yes. I need this survive yes. so you know don't just stop it but when you know that if you eat something your joints are going to ache you're going to have trouble walking the next day your face is going to break out you're going to be so bloated you'll have trouble standing up it's a whole different conversation you don't go oh i think i'll have a little of that exactly. you know <laughs> exactly exactly you've connected the dots right and, and you, you know, know how it makes you feel exactly. the difference is when you are eating this stuff all the time the symptoms are low grade and constant and you, it's like, it's like when you have a low buzzing noise, you get mm -hmm. used to it. Mm -hmm. But if all of a sudden, instead of having a low buzzing noise, the noise wasn't there at all. And then all of a sudden it was a loud shriek. You go, wow, that's what happens when you heal. Yes. You're really gut. The low buzzing noise goes away. That little irritation all the time goes away. And then when you do eat it, your body goes, because your body got rid of the defense system because it didn't need it. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you feel horrible. And you realize how much this was hurting you every single day.
and you feel so amazing. Yes. You go, why didn't I do this 20 years ago? You know, I know how, right? Oh my God. I, the why didn't I write that book 20, 30 years ago? I would have been in such better shape. <laughs> exactly. I would not have had such awful periods all my life had I only known to what extent my poor gut issues were creating yeah. all the other related issues. We which didn't nobody, know any of that back then. We didn't. I mean, I was in ER once a quarter and no one could figure it out. And amazing that I feel younger, healthier, happier now. So your diet is something that I you know, recommend to everybody. Give it a shot because you will be amazed at how you feel and you're never gonna wanna go back. And then you're and gonna wanna tell 20 weeks. people. Yeah, it's just three weeks. So it's three weeks. Three so weeks. You, you got you got anything, and, and literally, then you just connect those dots. So that's what happens over this rechallenge is you go one by one, connecting it back, and then at the end of that, now you have your new eating plan, and that's how you want to eat. And you once a year, you come back and you do this again because again, things change. All right, the last and final set of chapters, chapters 10, 11, and 12, where you talk about the Virgin Diet for Life, um, the, uh, the restaurant guide, and of course the diet recipes. Now for the rest of you, please check out the book. There's gonna be a link below to buy the book and you can get the recipes and the restaurant guides in there because we know that you're gonna have to figure out how to make this work around your weekends. So um, JJ's got some great tools for you uh, for, those, for those times. But let's talk a little bit about chapter 10, so Virgin Diet for Life. What's the essence of that? What do you want to leave? So with? again, the important thing is that you go through this every single year. So you really check it out. Now, I basically, I don't eat gluten and I don't eat dairy. Those are just out of my diet. Um, but I do check in and check on the ones that I do let in. So I do that every year. I go back and go, all right what happens if I make sure I don't eat eggs for at least a month and then I go back and eat them? How do I feel? Mm -hmm. So whatever foods you have left in, you go back and go through the same process again every year because again, leaky gut happens because of stress, gluten, fructose, different medications. Shifts to your gut microbiome. And that can happen for a variety of reasons. You know, if your hormones start to change because of aging, that can change your gut microbiome. You might get a leakier gut. Mm -hmm. So this isn't just, I did this, I'm done. Right? It really is for life. Yes, it really is for life. Yeah. Now, the other lifestyle side. Lifestyle change. Is, I call it lifestyle redesign. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Well, of course, you'd say you're a tech person. So <laughs> I'm constantly redesigning everything. Yes. Why, why not our lifestyle? The, the other part that's important, um, when I queried my community, it turns out one of their biggest concerns and biggest challenges was weight regain. And, you know, they'd get sick or they'd go on vacation and something would happen and then they completely lose it and blow it, right? And I think at that point, this is where we really need to be much kinder to ourselves. I don't think men do this, but women are really good at kicking their own butts. I think it's really about surrounding yourself with people who are also on the same journey, who will support you, who if you get, you know, fall off track, you get back on track. What I tell you is, you know, if you went on vacation, you lost your mind and, you know, then come back and start over. Exactly. It's fine, right? It happens and like learn from it for next time. JJ, this has been amazing. Any last parting advice? Um, so, you know, when you look and you know, because you've got all sorts of cool, cool docs and health experts in your world and in my world, like, you know, we all hang out together. And so there is no shortage of strategies. I do not believe this is a strategy challenge that we are facing. Like if someone's not able to lose the weight, you know, my, my area of expertise that I love the most is working with the most difficult weight loss uh, cases. That is usually not the challenge. The challenge is not having a why that makes you do it. Yes. And I, I remember I like was listened to this audio tape. I'm dating myself a gazillion times that was called. It's not the how, it's the why. Listen to Simon Sinek's TED Talk yeah. on on the, what is it called? The power of why I think, Yes. you know, when you really get down to it, if you are not where you want to be with your health, you need to get a bigger why I find for a lot of women. And we actually found this when we queried our community and, you know, here's a half million women 
And the biggest reason I heard for why they weren't where they wanted to be in their health was not because they were craving cheese <laughs> or they wanted sugar. The biggest reason, and this breaks my heart, honestly, that they were not where they wanted to be with their health was because they did not feel worthy. They did not feel good enough. And, you know, we are put here for big reasons. There's so much work to do. Like there's so much for each of us to do here. And there's legacies to leave. You know, if, if the legacy, like my most important legacies are my two boys, and I'm sure you feel the same way with your two girls. And you can't do that halfway, being tired and inflamed. Exactly. So find your why, make it so damn big that when that cookie shows up, you kick it to the curb and surround yourself with an incredible group of people who will hold you accountable and ideally hire a coach to help there too, and then go for it. And I think the other person to blame in this is everybody who tells us your symptoms are normal. They're part of the aging process. I heard that 20 times. You we know what? That's why bullshit. We are, we are the CEOs of our healthcare. We're in yes. charge. Yes. It's our journey. We are hiring consultants. Those doctors are consultants. That's what they are. They're not yes. gods. They're consultants. Exactly. And your job is to go out and find the best consultants, synthesize the information, figure out what's right for you on your path and take responsibility, right? Don't give up your responsibility to other people. Yeah. And don't put up with the symptoms. Don't put up with them like we no. put up with everything else. So with that said, big hugs to you, JJ. You're amazing. Thank you so much for all that you do. And for everybody else out there, stay smiling, get the book, check out the entire series and please share. I'll see you soon.